one belongs to the Reds. Welcome back to the Starlight Drive, and I believe Monroe Township is the place. We were just talking. It's Gamble and Finn, the reality check road show tonight for the very first time on the road, and we're out here because tonight the worldwide premiere of a movie and you can check out the movie poster. We've got that, too. How We Looking. Yeah, you just saw the trailer there you right go. there. You saw the trailer, the documentary of Hall of Fame broadcaster for the Cincinnati Reds, who had no idea that he was retiring at exactly the right time, <laughs> did he? But that would be uh, our special guest here on our, our stage, our gravel lot, whatever, Mr. Marty Brenneman. Nice Mar- to be with you guys. Glad uh, to have you. Thank you. And you got to love sitting down in a chair, putting a mic up to your mouth, and having the host go, dude, it's just us. I know it. It doesn't That's matter it. what you happens. What? <laughs> I'm good with it. I'm so good with it. How cool is this for you? I mean, really. I mean, you've obviously had a legendary career. You're in Cooperstown. You're in the Reds Hall of Fame. But I got to believe something like this, when you watch and you hear all the people talk about what you've meant to them in baseball, it's just got to be awesome. Well, I, you know, Tom, when I uh, when when uh, Terry first came to me about I don't know eighteen nineteen months ago about doing it, I and if I repeat some of the things he said, I apologize. But I told him I said, just hold off on this because they didn't know that I was going to announce in January of nineteen that was going to be my last oh. year. And then after the fact, I said it would be kind of ridiculous to have started this process not knowing that last year was going to be my last season. But my first reaction was I was stunned. I mean, I, I, I could not imagine anybody wanting to do a documentary on me. Not that I don't think I have a great career. I had a tremendous career, um, uh, as fulfilling as anything I could have ever dreamed about when I first started. But uh, you just don't think in those terms. Sure. You, don't, you don't think about that. Yeah. Well, well we, and I would say because you don't think in those terms makes you the perfect subject matter for something like this. Well, yeah, the, the great thing was to work with Terry Meyer and his people. He, he is an incredibly talented guy. All the people that, that work for him and with him are the same. In fact, so much so that uh, he was over our house, I don't know, two weeks ago, some finishing touches on some things that I needed to do for him. And he, uh, he asked Amanda and me, he said, would you like to see this? And I said, no. I, I wanted the, the night at the Starlight Drive-In, I want to see it for the first time like everybody else. And I think it was, he was kind of taken aback. Amanda, on the other hand, she wanted to see it. Yeah. And, and I prevailed. I said, well, I'm not going to watch it. I've seen, I saw the trailer. He, uh, Terry has religiously sent us outtakes of things that weren't, are not going to be in the finished product, which are really good. And so I, you know, I, uh, I'm really excited about seeing it for the very, very first time tonight. Be remiss if we didn't ask you, because a lot of people I don't think understand the how we look at I mean, yeah. true fans who have listened to Reds baseball and listened to you get it. But give the genesis of that the very first time that that came about and how that just became, really, it almost became an every game occurrence. Did it not in some way, shape, or form? I have no idea. <laughs> don't Is you really? Right? No clue. It's just the demented mind of a left-hander. <laughs> That's what I tell people. Say, well, uh, where did the Titanic struggle come from? I have no idea where that came from. I, I, uh, most of the stuff that I uttered, I, the only thing I can vaguely remember is that this one belongs to the Reds. And I can remember two weeks into my first year in 74, I think Concepcion got a hit in the bottom of the ninth or the bottom of the next inning on the road to uh, – uh, no, it was the bottom of the ninth at, at, at uh, Riverfront. To win the game, and and I was driving back to my house in Anderson Township that night, and thought, you know what, that might be a pretty good thing to That's end good. every Reds win with. Having no idea that I would say it as much as I said it right. in '74, '75, yeah. and '76, and uh, but the rest of it, I have no clue. I cannot even begin to tell you whether well, where how we looking came from. And you know what, I think a lot of those things take on a life of their own, they even do. if they come out of nowhere. But what's funny is it morphed into this other thing that became a secondary vernacular within the radio station. When I worked at EBN and would be in the hallways with the LW <laughs> oh, guys yeah. or whatever, Same all you'd have thing. to hear, you'd have to walk by and all you'd have to hear somebody go is, not good. Yeah. And that was it. You really <laughs> knew. Yeah. Even if the question hadn't been asked, yeah. that was the determination That's good. I like of where that. we were. I like that. That's <laughs> so very good. We might have been talking about something with the fireworks or we might have been talking about something else or you might have just been walking by going, not good. <laughs> well, it, it, it's funny. I, I actually emailed back and forth with Yid this week and he dropped a response to me that just said, not, not good. good. Yeah, he did, did he really? So, still going on. Yeah. Well, I felt sorry for Terry because he said people were commenting about this online and somebody, somebody would just put not good and then his buddy's like 
Did they see it? Did they not like Something, it? They yeah, just didn't right. get that part That's of funny. it. That's funny. I didn't know that. That's, That's yeah. good. Well, it was interesting. I was watching some of the Fox Sports Ohio did some of the old, you know, some of the classic the yeah. World Series games, and I had forgotten about you doing the crossover. And, man, did you look and sound young. I mean, you, do you ever, well, I, I was, was like, young. I know you were. But I want to ask you. You're <laughs> I'm a, scared to death, too. You're a baseball purist. I mean, you're a baseball. I am, you, well, I mean, you know what? I am, and and I have evolved into, in some situations, not. Well, that's what I wanted to ask you about, because I think most people, especially first it was with the old left-hander with Joe and then with the Cowboy, it seemed to me like you really loved kind of – you went from calling the baseball game to then just some of the banter that you guys had back and forth, and you obviously there were plenty of games where you needed that right. when the baseball wasn't paramount. Did you come to enjoy that a lot more than you ever thought you would? Yeah, and you know, the whole thing evolved with Joe. And I've had people come up to me and, and said, uh, you know, that's, that's really a, a really cool shtick. And I said, it's not a shtick. Yeah. I mean, because that implies that we sat down one day and said, you know what, we ought to talk about your golf game and my tomato plants and all the things and the Elvis Shrine and, and all the things that went on between me and Joe that had nothing to do with baseball. It's just something that evolved, and it evolved because of the friendship that we had. And, and, and everything was natural. It was nothing planned. Uh, the Elvis thing was one of the great things of all time because it was spontaneously one night uh, we'd start talking about Elvis. Joe, I had no, Joe didn't know Elvis Presley from that wall. <laughs> and, uh, and I'll tell you another good story about that, too. And so uh, I, I made a, con- a very innocent comment one night. I said, hey, if any of you folks listening to our broadcast have any Elvis memorabilia that you don't want back, I said, I want to underline that enough. Right, but if right. you want to send it in to me, I will make sure that it's displayed in the booth. I, we were inundated. Yeah. I mean, and in fact, we got some stuff that today is worth a lot of money. <laughs> really? And I was stunned by it. And then I had to put that stuff up every night and take it down. Um, so it, it was, it was, uh, and Brantley was the same way. Brantley had the same type of personality that Joe yeah. uh, did. And it, it was just a good relationship. You know, whether it would have flown in New York or Chicago and L.A., I don't know. But it worked here. And it was a good thing because God knows, I, I, I don't know what my one loss record is since 74 through 19, but it ain't good. Yeah. And that's a big old how we look at not good, <laughs> I can tell you. We're here at the Starlight Drive, and it's Gamble and Finn. It's the Reality Check Roadshow. Tonight's worldwide premiere of How We Look in the Documentary of Reds Hall of Fame broadcaster Marty Brenneman has been that. kind enough to uh, stop by and, and, and join us. Was there ever a... Was there any one particular game or time where you realized, because, I mean, I don't think sometimes, I know even when you're on the radio, you don't realize the power of the voice and that how many people listen and how many people just are on the edge of their seats listening. And you're describing games before there was all this TV right, where you could right. see every game. Yep. Was there any one game or any one moment where you said, man, this is crazy how important this is to people? We played a game one I, I think I knew by then, but it, w- it was really it, it came home. One night the Reds were playing the Giants at that old Candlestick Park in San Francisco, and John Miller had been in the booth and had talked about um, uh, when he had been with the Boston Red Sox. Uh, this was off the air, and, and how one night they were playing in Oakland, and he said, you know, if um, you, people listening to us back in Boston want to say this is before social media, you know, a card or a letter or a phone call to the the Red Sox office to let us know that at one thirty back in Boston you were listening to the game. So I, I opened it by saying to Joe during a commercial break, I said, it was like 10 minutes to 1. I said, why, when you come back, it's your seventh inning, why don't you, why don't you drop the F word on the air? And he said, what are you talking? I said, Nobody's listening to us back there at this time of night. I said, just go ahead and do it. And he said, no, you do it. I said, no, I'm not going to do it. It's your inning. Well, anyway, it's I your came inning. It was the funniest. It was his inning. Right. It was the funniest thing in the world because he really was serious. He thought I was serious. Oh, that's anyway, great. I came back and I said, you know, same thing John had said to Red Sox fans a number of years. We were inundated with mail. I think we had something like somewhere between 800 and 1,000 pieces of mail. And I talked to a guy who was in this type of business where there are formulas that you can do. He said, 
That it just that doesn't it happen. He of. said that's wow. impossible. Yeah. He said you cannot imagine how many people were up, closing in on one o'clock listening to your broadcast. At that point, I said, you know what we do, even at that late hour. And people got to get up and go to work the next day back here. They're still listening. That's fantastic. Well, and I would tell you that speaks to what you were just saying earlier, the organic nature of how you guys did things that you were storytelling even then. And, uh, you know, and I had the opportunity to work down with um, with Skip. We were just talking about Skip and Pete down right. in, at the Braves. And I, that's my only experience in the booth. I'd never had the opportunity to be up in there with you guys. But watching the interaction between those two guys and what they would get off to talking about. Well, they had know, the same kind of relationship exactly. that Joe and I had. And it was so it's so funny because, I mean, and, and as you said, after Joe, I mean, how many people know how many scoops of ice cream the radio guy likes when he goes to UDF? That's right. Exactly. But that was such a big part of the cowboy and you kind of making that, that, that mesh. And I just think it, I think it speaks to what a, what a part of the storytelling a storyteller you've been for people in this market and all the different yeah. things you've done well, outside that was one of the things that you know when i had the first three or four or five years uh, there was i couldn't tell these stories because i had no i had no background i had no experience oh, yeah. and when i reached the point where something would happen in a game and i could relate it to something that had happened a number of years ago i thought you know what i'm getting there now because I, I always marvel at scully who was, is the greatest storyteller of all time as far as baseball is concerned and and I had I, that's a handicap that I I had to deal with, and once I got to that point and I could tell stories and uh, it, it it really enhances the broadcast, but it takes a while. I have two more questions for you. One, watching the trailer and hearing your son Tom mention about you doing basketball games, it's got to make you feel great though, knowing that Tom did Cubs games, did Diamondback games, and now he's back here doing Reds games on TV. You've had the chance to work with him. Yep. But basketball for you. Obviously, baseball was, the, you know, and they say, you know, multi-sport athletes, some guys made the right choice. When you look back, though, how much did you enjoy basketball? You had an opportunity to do a lot of great. I mean, you were in the ACC and doing NCAA games. Baseball still the right choice for you? It was the right choice, but I, I got so much enjoyment out of doing college basketball. I mean, it was just, it was such a kick. And even today, I'm, I am in that category that they refer to when they say so-and-so is a junkie. I, 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 I read recruiting services. I know where guys are going to go You're to school. You're that guy. I know. I'm an obnoxious You're that guy, right? <laughs> but but I, uh, I, I, was ble- I was so blessed when I did the NCAA because I had, I had so many great games. I had the Leitner game. Yeah. Um, I, I just, the one right after the other. Greg Anthony hit a shot in overtime against Arizona in the regional final out at Nichols Arena in Denver, which is no longer there, right. that, that sent them into the Final Four, which was a major upset. Uh, I, I was just blessed to, to be a part of what I think is the greatest sporting event in the history of mankind, and that's the NCAA tournament. Yeah. I don't think there's anything that can equal it. And so I was blessed. I really was. Now, this for me, I'm going to ask you, but this is probably the toughest for you. I watched that trailer, and I'm like, man, started with Hank Aaron, and what, what a way to start, right? Yeah. But, I mean, when you look at Browning's perfect game to Griffey's 500 to all the great – do you have – are there two or three that stick out more than any others as the most memorable? And, and one question I have, did you like – when you knew something, you're on the precipice of somebody hitting number 500. Mm-hmm. Did you work it out in your mind how you would make that call, or did you just let it flow? I let it flow. I, I don't. I know guys that have done that, and they've 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 come up with something that was cute, and people would talk about for years to come. I was not good enough to <laughs> pull it off and make it, con- it, it, and it didn't sound contrived. I could not do that, so I had to rely on being able to, you know, go with the flow and 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 and, and try and create verbally the kind of at. Ad- uh, aura that was in the ballpark the atmosphere and hopefully that it worked um and and i was fortunate because i think all the big calls that i had i don't think i screwed up any of them no you didn't um but the two calls that probably are my favorite calls were griffey's 500th home run off matt morris on a father's day in st louis and uh jay bruce's home run that uh, Uh, beat the astros and sent them into the postseason in 2010 they were the two calls that and we, you know, we, we're, we, I'm, I'm my own worst critic. I would, I could walk out of a booth and say I had a good night or I had a bad night, and I knew that. Uh, but I was happy with those calls, and uh, over and above, you know, having Rose's hit and Browning's perfect game and yeah. Seaver's no hitter and all the rest of that stuff. All right. Well, I would tell you too, yeah. everybody, uh, anybody that ever heard you knew that 
you were your own toughest critic, as you could have been with anybody, and they knew they were always getting the honest truth from Well, you. I appreciate that. I, I was fortunate to work for people that, uh, over the years, I'm sure they cringed. John Allen it, it was a, a COO one time, and, and we would say, we'd be at, at cocktail parties or social events, and he'd say, somebody would bring that up, and John would say, uh, in mixed company, you know, you have to understand that Marty's opinions oftentimes are not those of ownership <laughs> and management, and everybody would the laugh. Old disclaimer. He was dead serious. Right. Yeah. <laughs> he wasn't messing around. Oh. Well, Marty's great night. We're glad to be here. Thanks, it's fellas. always Enjoyed great to being see with you. Thanks, Thanks for so being much. out here. Yeah, it's going to be a lot of fun. And best of luck with the it. movie. Should be fun. I hope so. Thank you. Right, Thanks a lot. Stuff. And by the way, you're looking great. Thank oh, you. Yeah.